Hello and welcome. We're pleased to have people joining today from 47 countries to take part in a conversation about the urgent need for new effective treatments for people with progressive MS. During our time together, we'll be answering questions that people have provided from all over the world on treatments that are currently available, potential new treatments that are clinical trials, and how research discoveries may lead to our ultimate goal of ending MS progression. My name is Marie Vaillant, and I'm joining you today from Ottawa, Canada, the nation's capital. I've been involved with the MS Society of Canada and the MS International Federation for several years, serving in a variety of leadership positions. Additionally, I currently serve on both the Scientific Steering Committee and People Affected by MS Engagement Coordination Team of the International Progressive MS Alliance. As someone that has lived with progressive MS since 1996, I give voice to people with MS, not only from North America, but also internationally through my experience on the board of the MS International Federation. It is important that people affected by MS are involved in every stage of the research process because this helps ensure a focus on research that has the greatest potential to improve quality of life for people with MS worldwide. In a moment, I will introduce to you our outstanding panel of experts but first, I'd like to recognize our webcast sponsor and share some information about the International Progressive MS Alliance. We are grateful for the generous support of our sponsor, Sanofi. Thank you for helping make this webcast possible. The Alliance is an unprecedented global collaboration to end progressive MS. It includes 19 MS organizations, hundreds of researchers and health professionals, the pharmaceutical industry, companies, foundations, donors, and people affected by progressive MS. In short, the Alliance has brought the world together to solve progressive MS. To date, the Alliance has invested over 24 million euros to research with an overall commitment of 60 million euros through 2025. Let's go to the discussion. With me today are leading MS experts who are working to help people with MS live better lives today and help fuel research to help MS progression. Dr. G. Wan O is a staff neurologist, scientist, and medical director of the Barlow Multiple Sclerosis Program at St. Michael's Hospital in Toronto, Canada. Dr. Jeffrey Cohen is a professor of neurology in the Cleveland Clinic Learner College of Medicine in the United States and a leader in a large number of MS clinical trials. And Dr. Emma Gray is the assistant director of research at the MS Society in the United Kingdom and leader of the strategic development of the MS Society's research program. We will start today's discussion reviewing the current treatment options for people with progressive MS, then talk about potential treatments and clinical trials, and finally, research efforts to find new and better solutions. Dr. O, let me begin with you. Depending on where you live in the world, there may be as many as 25 treatments for relapsing remaining MS, yet it seems there is little or perhaps nothing for most people with progressive MS. What do you tell your patients with progressive MS about current treatment options? Thanks, Marie. Um, so, you know, I, I don't think it would be an exaggeration to say that MS is probably one of the neurological fields where there has been the greatest amount of progress in the last uh, two decades with respect to treatments. And we're really lucky that, um, you know, back in the early 90s, there really were no disease modifying treatments. But now, um, as you said, in different parts of the world, there can be up to 25 different treatments, which is amazing. Um, but it's true that most of these treatments are for people with um, relapsing MS. Um, and I think there is a great recognition in the field that um, we need to do better uh, for people living with progressive MS. However, it's not that there isn't anything for people with progressive MS. I think it's really important to note that um, in 2017, the first treatment was approved for primary progressive MS. And uh, this is ocrelizumab. And um, you know, in the clinical trial, it showed about a 24% reduction in the risk of disability progression over approximately two years. And 24% isn't a huge amount, but I think it's still important to note that for the first time, um, there actually are um, disease modifying treatments that are approved for people with progressive MS. It's just that these treatments likely do not completely halt the disease and they don't repair damage that was already done. 
And so it's clear that we need to do better, but I think we also need to focus on the positive in that there are treatments for progressive MS, um, ocrelizumab for primary progressive MS and um, saponimod um, for active secondary progressive MS. And because there's a recognition in the field now that um, you know, some of the disease subtyping that we're doing, there's a lot of overlap between uh, disease subtypes. Um, depending on what part of the world you're in, if you have active secondary progressive MS, which means that you do have progressive components of disease, but you also still have superimposed relapses and MRI lesions developing, then you can actually have access to many of the different treatments that are available um, for relapsing types of MS. So bottom line is, um, you know, as you said, it's a really exciting time in the field because there's many different treatments. Many of them are for the relapsing kind of inflammatory types of MS, but there are actually two different treatments available for progressive MS subtypes. But it's clear that we need to do better and develop treatments that have a more profound effect on stopping the disease. And um, hopefully in the future, we'll have treatments that can repair um, damage that has already been done. Great. Thank you. As a follow-up, um, when there isn't a treatment for progressive MS to slow the progression, what can be done to help an individual maintain their health and improve their quality of life? This is very important to me because I focus on my well-being, and normally at this time, I would be uh, doing a Zumba class at the gym. So can you talk to me about options for in this area? Um, so, you know, Maria, as you note, I think there's a lot that can be done. Obviously, disease modifying treatments are, you know, one component of addressing a chronic disease like MS. But um, on a day to day basis, there's a lot of things that people can do to help with symptoms um, and to help them um, live their best possible lives. And these include things like Zumba, like you said, um, exercise is really, really key, um, yoga, uh, Pilates, even just getting to the gym or, um, you know, joining a walking group. Um, these are all things that, you know, get people out of the house, um, strengthen your muscles, um, but also allow you to just interact and um, have um, conversations with people. And I think that um, leisure component is really key um, to people, um, you know, maintaining connections with people around them. And um, it's actually been shown not just in people with MS, but everybody that these leisure activities and networking are one of the things that can prevent um, cognitive decline um, the greatest um, in terms of um, many different things you can do. Um, there's also many different ways that you can manage symptoms with MS. So I would encourage anybody with bothersome symptoms to talk to their neurologist. Um, you know, as a neurologist, I wish I had a magic pill that I could use for many different symptoms, but there's actually different things that you can use for symptoms like spasticity, um, pain, um, fatigue, and not all of these are pills. There are strategies that you can use every day um, to manage some of the symptoms that when you ask um, people uh, bother them the most. So symptoms like fatigue and pain are things that are there all the time and probably greatly affect people's abilities to even get out of the house and do things. And so I think these are the symptoms that um, can be addressed and then um, can make a huge difference in terms of quality of life. Great. Thank you very much. Dr. Cohen, you've been involved in a number of clinical trials to develop MS treatments. Why is it so challenging to develop therapies for progressive MS? Well, thanks for that, that question, Marie. So as uh, Jiwon highlighted, uh, we've made tremendous progress in treating the relapsing aspects of, of multiple sclerosis and, and much less progress in treating the progressive aspects of the disease. And, and I, I think that's for two main reasons. One is that our, our understanding of the biology of progression uh, is less complete. Uh, and it appears that it, it's different than what drives the relapsing aspects of the disease that causes relapses and uh, lesion activity on MRI. In contrast, in progressive MS, it's probably much more of a, uh, what we call a compartmentalized uh, uh, chronic inflammatory process. So inflammation that's widespread throughout the brain behind the blood brain barrier. So it's not accessible to our medications. Uh, and, uh, and in addition, there's probably uh, a component of neurodegeneration. So deterioration of the nervous system, even if there is not uh, ongoing uh, um, damage. 
Uh, and so those two aspects have turned out to be much more difficult to treat. Uh, but we're starting to make some headway there. I think we'll talk about some potential approaches later that we think may address those aspects. The other reason why I think progress has been uh, slower uh, in treating the progressive aspects of the disease uh, are that it's more difficult to measure that. And, in, and particularly uh, uh, endpoints that we could use in, clin in preliminary clinical trials to show that a, a treatment shows promise before we embark on a large, definitive, pivotal trial. One of the reasons why we've made such rapid progress in relapsing MS is uh, because we can utilize uh, MRI, specifically gadolinium-enhancing lesion and other le measures of lesion activity uh, in preliminary studies. Uh, and if uh, a potential treatment shows promise on that outcome, uh, it's almost certainly going to work on reducing relapses. Uh, in contrast, in progressive MS, we're, we're just now starting to uh, learn of some measures that could serve the same purpose. Uh, and I think once we start employing those, you'll see that we'll make much more rapid uh, headway. Good. Thank you. Dr. Cohen, even with the challenges you've noted, it's encouraging to see that there are current clinical trials focused on treatments for people with progressive MS. Dr. Cohen, can you describe some of these efforts? Specifically, a lot of people watching asked about BTK inhibitors. Right. So, that, so that's one of the treatments that I was referring to a minute ago. So there's a lot of excitement, a lot of anticipation uh, around the, the BTK inhibitors. So uh, that's a group, the BTK inhibitors represent a, a group of, of medications uh, that inhibit uh, so-called Bruton's tyrosine kinase, BTK, uh, which is a very important uh, mechanism uh, in a variety of immune cells uh, that we uh, that we think uh, represents an, a, a potential target for for treatment of progressive MS, uh, and the reason why we think that is is that uh, the BTK inhibitors uh, have some of the effects uh, of the so-called B cell depleting therapies, uh, for example, ocrelizumab that uh, Jiwan referred to a minute ago. Uh, but in a, uh, and so they'll they it's, it's it's expected that they'll have some of the efficacy of the B cell depleting therapies. Uh, but in addition, uh, the BTK inhibitors are, are, for the most part, are able to get into the brain uh, and have some effects on some of the intrinsic uh, immune mechanisms within the nervous system uh, that we think uh, are not effectively targeted by our, our current therapies. There's a, a sizable number of BTK inhibitors currently uh, under investigation. They have a variety of pharmacologic properties. Uh, but our, uh, we're anxiously awaiting the results of some of the uh, uh, ongoing studies, which we think will start to read out uh, maybe later this year or early next year. Good. Thank you. Dr. Cohen, another area of interest that people watching the webcast asked about is the use of stem cell treatment in progressive MS. What can you tell us about these treatments? Well, so I, I get a lot of questions uh, in the office about stem cells. In fact, probably almost every day. Uh, and, and I think a good place to start is to clarify that uh, there are many kinds of potential stem cell therapies. One can cannot just talk about stem cells in general, but one has to be a little bit more specific about what one's uh, uh, talking about. Um, uh, and I like to group the stem cell therapies into two broad categories. One would be uh, an anti-inflammatory approach. Uh, so this would be typified by hematopoietic stem cell transplantation. Uh, so this is a treatment uh, uh, in which uh, uh, high-dose chemotherapy is administered uh, to eliminate the existing immune system. Uh, and then the, the immune system is um, uh, re replaced by, the, uh, by administering hematopoietic stem cells, uh, the stem cells that give rise to the blood cells, with the, with the hope that the newly formed immune system will function more normally. Uh, so that therapy uh, is more akin to a souped up version of our currently available medications. It does what our current medications do, but we think does it more potently. So it's primarily a, a treatment for the relapsing inflammatory aspects of the disease. Uh, and it's not turned out to be very helpful for 
uh, uh, the progressive aspects of the disease. Uh, it's also a very risky uh, procedure. So that's why I caution uh, my patients uh, uh, to be uh, um, careful about pursuing that. Uh, the other broad category of stem cell approaches are, are stem cell approaches that are intended to promote repair. Uh, as uh, Jiwan uh, mentioned, uh, the purpose of, of, our, of our currently available therapies is to prevent ongoing damage, uh, and none of them directly promotes repair. So that's what is hoped uh, these other stem cell approaches might uh, accomplish. Uh, the type of that approach that's so far been studied the most is using so-called mesenchymal stem cells. So these are stem cells that can be isolated from bone marrow or from uh, fat, uh, a variety of other tissues, uh, whose natural job, it appears, uh, is to promote uh, uh, the intrinsic repair processes that all of our tissues have, but sometimes are not uh, adequate. Um, uh, so there have been a number of studies of mesenchymal stem cells. Uh, there are a lot of technical questions that still need to be answered, but I'd say that's one approach that looks promising. The other approach I would mention very briefly is, is uh, a number of medications that we think may work by stimulating the intrinsic stem cells, the stem cells that are already in the nervous system, uh, uh, the goal of which would be to make them function more uh, robustly. Uh, the advantage of, of that approach is, is that uh, medications present many fewer technical challenges as opposed to a, a stem cell therapy, where there's lots of unanswered questions about how many cells to inject and how often to inject them and how to grow them in culture and how to administer them. Medications, on the other hand, uh, may be a much more straightforward uh, approach. Good. Thank you. Thank you for demystifying a very complicated topic. We use the term plain language uh, mm -hmm. as people affected by MS. So I appreciate you uh, um, making a complicated uh, topic understandable to the, to the non-scientists in the group. Thank you. Well, thanks. While we're on the topic of clinical trials, there's been frustration among people with progressive MS that trials often exclude many people due to their age, their level of disability. This can be disheartening to somebody like me who feels um, because I'm a woman of a certain age um, that I often get excluded from clinical trials and would like to participate. So the approach that I've taken is I've um, participated in a number of trials here at the University of Ottawa in the clinical exercise physiology lab, which I don't get excluded from. Dr. Cohen, can you tell us about what is being done to make trials available to more people? Yeah, so that's really a, a good question. So when uh, clinical trials are a very complicated undertaking, and when we're uh, designing a trial uh, and determining what are the so-called eligibility criteria for the trial, uh, the purpose of those criteria is, is several things. One is to enroll people that uh, are, are more likely to benefit from the therapies that are being tested. Uh, secondly, uh, that don't have other features that might uh, interfere with interpreting the results. Uh, and then finally, uh, to enroll people that are less likely to, to be harmed by the, the treatments that are being tested. Uh, and so we, we spent a lot of time designing those criteria to, to meet those needs. But the, I think you're correct that there's been a recognition that by making our criteria too specific, uh, it sometimes is difficult to generalize from the results of the trial to how that that treatment's going to perform in real life uh, uh, with a much broad when it's used in a much broader population. So there is a a lot of effort uh, now being uh, paid to uh, design our trials so that they're informative, so they give us a result, uh, but that uh, uh, the population enrolled reflects the population in which the treatment will be used. And, and to that uh, point, uh, there, there recently was a, ver a large consensus conference that was organized uh, by the uh, International Advisory Committee on Clinical Trials, an organization that's sponsored by the uh, U.S. National MS Society and ECTRMS, a professional organization, to address that specific uh, question. Good. 
Thank you. It's nice to hear that there's um, work being undertaken in this area. There's also exciting efforts occurring in the United Kingdom. Dr. Gray, people with progressive MS urgently need effective treatments, yet clinical trials can take a long time and are very expensive. The MS Society in the UK is working to change this through a novel approach called Octopus. What is this initiative and tell us how does it work? Thanks, Marie. It's a really great question. They do take a long time and they are really expensive. And I think we all want to do better. You know, people with progressive MS need more urgent help. We can't just accept the status quo. So in the UK, what we did is we really uh, we gained our inspiration from the cancer field where they pioneered uh, designing, I guess, more efficient trials. And there's one type of these trials called a MAMS trial. So this stands for multi-arm, multi-stage, which essentially means you can test uh, multiple treatments at once and you can combine multiple trial stages together. So you don't have to set up and close down a trial. And you can add in new treatments when they become available or you know, show promise. And you can, you know, with the use of special markers, you can get rid of ones that aren't performing. So this saves you time and money. So this approach was used really successfully in treating advanced prostate cancer, an area that had previously seen little progress, killed 10,000 people a year in the UK. Um, so they designed a MAMS trial called Stampede, uh, and it's shown that so the results were that people taking certain drugs on top of the standard hormone therapy increases your chance of survival. And they've had several treatment arms added into Stampede. There's now more than 10,000, uh, 20, 000, sorry, 12,000, get that number right, um, people that have joined Stampede um, and the findings now have changed how men with prostate cancer are treated around the world. So, you know, this was hugely inspiring and it was led by a, a fantastic statistician called Professor Max Palmer at UCL in the UK. So what we did is we said to him, will you come and work with us essentially? And will you help us build and design one of these for progressive MS? We want one of these. Um, he was delighted to, and we've been working with him as a collaboration in the UK um, co-designing it with uh, people affected by MS and as you say Marie you're making it as in the design of it as inclusive as possible for people so people didn't feel excluded you know increased upper age limit as well as kind of level of disability that you uh, you could join um this has been going on since about 2018 so now we have octopus and octopus is the name of the trial the trial was picked the name of it was picked by people affected by MS and it's being led by uh, Professor Palmer and Professor Jeremy Chataway as the MS expert in at UCL in the UK funded by UK MS Society. So it will be the first ever MAMS trial in MS in the world. Um, and we really just want it to accelerate the treatment of, you know, development of treatments to slow or stop progression. And it's opening imminently in the UK and we'll be testing a control arm and, and two arms with neuroprotective um, properties in them. So, you know, the idea is they could slow down the damage uh, caused by this neurodegeneration. People would have an MRI scan after 18 months and then we'd have a look at it to see are these treatments worth progressing or can we get rid of them and bringing more promising ones in. So it's really exciting. And I guess to say the vision really is for it to be a really collaborative, efficient trials program, maybe a go-to resource uh, for the research community. We want to develop treatments faster, people with progressive MS, and we're now going to work on trying to see if we can make this a global platform. You know, can, we gen can we bring in international partners and treatments? Maybe even potential treatments developed through the Alliance could end up being tested through this trials platform. So I'd say watch this space. It's really, really exciting. We're glad that we're kind of close to opening. Great, thank you, very exciting news. It's clear that research is needed to develop a much better understanding of progression in MS. For instance, why is it that one person with MS progresses rapidly and another person maintains stability in their disease? Dr. O, you're helping lead a very large research study in Canada called CanProCo that hopes to answer some of the big questions about progressive MS. Can you tell us more about this study? Sure. Um... So um, CANPROCO stands for the Canadian Prospective Cohort Study to Understand Progression in MS. And uh, we really tried to come up with something catchy like octopus, but unfortunately, <laughs> it's landed on CANPROCO. And when you say it enough, it actually rolls off the tongue, but um, it takes a lot of practice. But um, CANPROCO is um, an effort that is very near and dear to my heart. It's been going on since 2017 when we um, were awarded a planning grant. And it actually was a grant that brought together probably almost all of the clinicians and scientists doing um, MS research in Canada. And um, it's essentially a cohort study that was designed specifically with the goal of trying to better understand progression in MS, which as you've heard from Jeff is 
probably one of the greatest unmet needs that we have right now. Um, and so what we did is initially with a planning grant for a year, we thought about what study designs we could come up with that would help to address this question. And obviously there weren't unlimited funds. So we went through many different iterations and landed on a study design that we thought over five years um, would allow us to um, um, gain some important insights into progressive mechanisms in MS. And so um, what it is, is a thousand patients enrolled um, at the five largest MS centers in Canada. And we specifically um, had pretty strict um, inclusion criteria and are trying to look across um, the entire spectrum of MS. So when we're enrolling people that have radiologically isolated syndrome, what many people think of as pre-symptomatic MS, as well as early relapsing remitting MS, as well as primary progressive MS. And we're collecting a, a really large amount of data on all these people. Um, what we're doing is getting um, blood samples, we're getting cerebral spinal fluid. Every year we're getting um, really high quality MRIs of the brain and spinal cord. Um, and we're collecting a wealth of clinical measures, including using um, novel digital devices like uh, smartphone apps, as well as iPad-based um, clinical tests, and then collecting a whole bunch of questionnaires, looking at even things like workplace productivity, quality of life, fatigue, mood, all of these things. And then in Canada, we actually have the benefit of having provincial administrative databases. So we're linking all of that data to um, other uh, administrative measures, including um, you know, uh, medications, hospital um, use, emergency room uh, use, things like postal codes, um, all of these things. And so the goal of that is we're really casting a wide net and we're doing a deep dive of data collection because we're looking at um, not just say biological measures or imaging measures, um, we're looking at how all of these things um, likely have an interplay to cause um, progression in MS. And again, we're looking across a very wide spectrum um, of people with MS. Um, so I'm really happy to report that um, despite the pandemic, recruitment is complete as of last year, and we're already generating um, some really interesting um, results that we presented at recent international uh, congresses, um, you know, looking at specific aspects of uh, progression in MS. Um, and like Emma said, as with Octopus, um, the goal is to share these data widely. Um, we don't wanna just keep it in Canada. We're looking to establish collaborations with many other cohorts around the world. And um, the cohort was actually designed so that eventually we can share data with other um, cohorts. Um, and we eventually want to make it an open database so that qualified investigators around the world can use the data for their studies. Um, so really excited that, you know, we, the data are now available, we're continuing to collect, we're trying to get more funding to extend the duration of the cohort, and I think um, you'll probably hear, be hearing a lot more about it and look forward to working with colleagues around the world to use this really valuable data set so that hopefully we'll get closer to finding a cure for MS. Wow, really exciting. Thank you, Dr. O. Dr. Gray, you're also on the International Progressive MS Alliance Scientific Steering Committee, and the Alliance has several research initiatives that are working to accelerate the development of new treatments for people with progressive MS. Can you describe some of these? Uh, yeah, of course, there's lots to highlight. So firstly, I'll mention the Challenges in Progressive MS Awards. Uh, we're currently funding 17 novel research projects from around the world uh, to create new knowledge about what leads to progression and identify new targets for potential treatment development, which is really exciting. Uh, these uh, projects will report their findings this June, um, and the most promising results will be funded for further development to help develop you know, their findings um, to help speed up new areas for treatments, which you know could one day slow progression. Uh, the second really important initiative are um, we're funding two international drug discovery networks as part of a larger collaborative network awards. Um, and these are really large scale, first of their kind, multidisciplinary and multinational efforts to develop treatments for progressive MS again. Um, and one of these networks that's led by Professor Francisco Quintana at Harvard uh, was actually just awarded an additional three million euros of funding from the Alliance, um, really with the kind of next phase of investment uh, which will enable the team to advance the discovery of a compound they found that uh, may stop MS progression. They need to refine, optimise and test the most promising actual compound formula. And if that's successful, this compound you know, could then ultimately be tested in people. So it's really, really exciting to see that develop. 
Good. Thank you. We're near the end of our time, so I want to ask each panelist to share what you find the most promising about the future in terms of new life-changing treatments for people with progressive MS. Let's start with you, Dr. O. What is the most promising to you? Well, I, I think there's a lot happening, as you heard, and a lot of hope. But um, one thing is, I think it's really clear just even that there's the existence of this International Progressive MS Alliance. There's all these huge studies happening around the world. And I think we truly live in an information era where we now have the technology and capabilities of sharing with each other. I think that is going to be a driving force of uh, scientific discovery in the years to come. So I am really, really hopeful that with all of these um, studies that are happening and this international recognition of the importance of developing treatments for progressive MS, we'll have something um, really helpful and game-changing in the years to come. Great, thank you. Dr. Cohen, what do you think the future will bring for people with progressive MS? Well, so my hope, my expectation is, is that we'll have uh, uh, much more effective treatments. But I, I would say that that's based on uh, what I was going to highlight, which is, uh, I think, the conceptual realization uh, that there are not probably uh, distinct stages to multiple sclerosis and distinct categories, but rather there are disease mechanisms, uh, mechanisms that, that drive relapses, mechanisms that drive progression. Uh, and th those mechanisms are present throughout the disease course uh, to varying degrees and, and to different degrees in different people. But uh, you know, MS is not a disease of categories. It's a disease of, of mechanisms. And so I think uh, targeting our therapies to address processes rather than categories of, of patients uh, is going to lead to much more rapid progress. Good. Thank you. And finally, Dr. Gray, what would you highlight? Okay. Well, I'll be swift as you've had some really fantastic answers from Dr. Owen. <laughs> Cohen. I mean, I mean, and actually, I'm obviously based in the UK, really excited to see what Octopus, where it can take us as an MS community. It feels like a momentous opportunity for developing new treatments and as a clinical trials community. But I guess I guess what really excites me and motivates me, I kind of get you out of bed in the morning type feeling, is actually there's a real tangible momentum now. And you can feel this international energy around tackling and ultimately ending progression for everyone, you know, everyone with MS and, you know, as as Jeffrey says, it's, it's about mechanism and everyone needs a treatment for progression. So that's really exciting. You can feel that's on the horizon. Um, and of course, the Alliance is enormous precursor to this. So I guess it just feels really great to play a part in the movement. So bright great. future, I think. Thank you. It's all very exciting news on the research front that's taking place. Personally, I'm honored to sit on the Scientific Steering Committee and see firsthand the international collaboration engagement that will change the lives of people of, with progressive MS. Today, we address some of the leading questions regarding developing new treatments for people with progressive MS. This is a vital and urgent effort. As I hope you experience with today's panelists, there are amazing, talented, and dedicated people working to find solutions to the challenges that people affected by progressive MS face. And the International Progressive MS Alliance continues to inspire hope and make progress through funding research that can improve people's lives. Still, we must and will do more to end progressive MS. Thank you to our panel of experts, Dr. G. Wan O, oh, Dr. Jeffrey Cohen, and Dr. Emma Gray. And thanks to all of you for watching today. Please stay connected to the MS Alliance through our regular webcasts and your MS organization. And please share the work of the Alliance with others. We need everyone to be part of this effort. Together, we are stronger than progressive MS. Thank you.